Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. What's up with everybody? You braved the bicycles and you've still made it to church. Knuckle bump a neighbor and say, I'm so glad you made it. All right, just let them know that. We, uh, we've been preparing for this uh, for quite a while. Last year, it was kind of a surprise, but we were ready this year. And uh, I, I think we can uh, show some love for these uh, cyclists uh, afterwards just by going and cheering them on. Uh, we wouldn't wish them to get in an accident, but last year there was a little pile up, you know, at the last corner. So uh, you have uh, lunch and some entertainment. I don't know. Uh, but uh, did you guys see how fast they're going? And they're like right next to each other. Any s cyclists here? Anybody do that? Okay, wow. Man, that is a dangerous sport. I didn't realize it until watching these guys. I, I, I think when we get done with church is the professional round. So they're going to be doing like 50 miles an hour. So pretty crazy. Uh, but my name is Jim Cruz. I'm the lead pastor here. And we are so grateful that you are here and you are coming into a series that we've been in. This is our fifth stop, I believe. And it's going to be a great morning. But before we get into the talk, it is Memorial Day weekend. And I know Memorial Day is officially tomorrow, and it is to recognize and honor those that gave the ultimate sacrifice for our country. But I just want to take a moment and honor all veterans. I want to honor all people in the, the armed services. So if you've ever served our country through our military uh, or you are currently serving, would you stand to your feet so we can just take a moment and just honor you and just thank you for your service. Thank you guys so much. Great job. Um, somebody told me that they're like doing a flyover at the Dover Park tomorrow. So uh, some good uh, festivities tomorrow. Uh, so honor some veterans. Um, but we are in a series called The New Exodus. And today's talk is simply entitled, Let's Meet Up. Go ahead and tell three people around you, say, let's meet up. Let's meet up. And you could look at them and say, are you serious? <laughs> you want to meet up? Uh, yeah, after, after church at the food trucks, uh, we're going to meet up. Uh, but uh, we're, we're taking this journey through the book of Exodus, which is the original story of how Moses led the people of Israel out of captivity into a new identity to a promised destiny. And so what we've discovered in this series is that their story is actually our story. And as you have made a decision to follow Jesus, that's exactly what he does, does for your life. He pulls you out of your captivity, right? Gives you a new identity and leads you into your promise destiny. So today we're kind of on this place in the journey where we actually get to meet with God. And this is probably the most powerful and the most important part of the journey. And, you, you know, one might even argue that this is the whole point 
of the journey is so that we can be with God. So let me pray. We're going to jump in to Exodus chapter 25. As the fellows were telling you, uh, we have an app that you can follow along in our notes. But let me pray this. Father, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for your presence that is here with us. And God, I pray that, Lord, there would be a heavenly encounter for every person's life that showed up today. That, God, they would experience you. Some people in this room, God, may be experiencing you for the first time. Lord, I feel and sense that there are some people that haven't experienced you in a while. And, Lord, may they come home today. May they come back into your presence, Lord, and just be completely revived, Lord, in, in this amazing journey that we get to, to be on for you, for your kingdom. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Hey, today, by the way, besides Memorial Day weekend, it is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, so I brought, I brought the revival shirt out, and I didn't point it out last uh, service, and they thought it said devil. All right? So, <laughs> so I was like, it says revival. All right? Oh, so um, just pointing that out. So, all right. Exodus chapter 25. So Moses is having these encounters with Jesus, or not Jesus, but uh, he's encountering God, and he's having these meetings with God, and God is giving Moses these words. And in verse 8, it says, Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. You must build the tabernacle and the furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. So now the commandments have been given, right? The, the rules to live by, as we talked about last week. And, and God is drawing the people in to a relationship with him. Because it started with one man. It started with Moses meeting with God. Remember the burning bush. He meets with him on the mountaintop. And now this process is happening. God wants to go from the mountain, and he, now he wants to be with the people. But it has to be very specific because there's a problem. God is holy. We are not. And so there has to be a proper way for this tabernacle, this tent of meeting. In the Hebrew language, it literally is translated the dwelling place. So, so God wants to dwell with his people, but the, the place has to be set up in a specific way. Now, Exodus may bore some of us because it gets into the details of how the tent is to be set up and how it's to be built. Now, I just have the, kind of like a, an illustration of what this tent would have looked like, this tabernacle that was instructed in the book of Exodus, how they would set this up. Very meticulous, very specific, and this is how they were to worship God. And God says, if you do it this way, I am going to dwell with you. I'm going to be among you. So the first step in the process is they are to take the tent and, and build it and put it outside the camp. So jump down with me to verse 7 of chapter 33. It says, now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance to their tent. Now, now the next part is like one of the most special verses, I believe, in the Old Testament. It says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. This was unprecedented. This wasn't happening. And now Moses has this connection with God where God is in heaven, but he's coming to earth to meet face to face, one to one with Moses. So this, this tent, for you sci-fi geeks out there, like you know that you, you talk about portals and going to different dimensions, this tent is like a portal that is bringing heaven to earth. 
And now Moses is having this encounter with God and talking to him like a friend talks to a friend. Jump over to verse or chapter 40, verse 34. So now the tent is on the outside of the camp. Now the tent is within the camp with the people. And it says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it, but the cloud did not rise. They remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so that the whole family of Israel could see it. And this continued throughout all their journeys. So you have this picture of now the people are encountering God. He's with them. He's among them. Now, this is good news for us. Because as you fast forward to our life in Christ, what you need to understand is because God is holy and we are not, we needed a high priest, but we also needed an unblemished sacrifice. And Jesus is not only our new high priest, he's also our unblemished sacrifice. So Jesus becomes the portal for now us to be able to meet with God anytime, anywhere, any place. So think about this. You concert goers... When's the last time you threw down the extra money to get the VIP pass? How many have ever done a meet and greet for a concert? Come on, raise your hands. Now, if you ever like had a friend or a family member that was like part of the crew, you, you were really somebody when you got the all access pass. You ever have one of those? I've, I've hosted a lot of concerts in my day and, and because I'm a promoter, because I'm part of the concert, I'll get an all access pass, meaning I can go anywhere I want, anytime I want and meet with whoever I want while I'm there. And so an all access pass is given to you so that you can have access all the time. So what you have now discovered in a relationship with Jesus is you have an all access pass to God. Think about this for a second. I, I think sometimes in church we hear something so often, it just kind of gets numb to us, the significance of this. I mean, think about all the hoops they had to jump through so that God could be with them. Jesus has jumped all through all the hoops that need to be jumped through so that we can have an all-access pass with God. I mean, don't let this get numb, church, on you. I mean, let, let me put this in like, you know, real practical terms. Let, let's say, and I've used this illustration before. Let's say you have this person, it's a celebrity, it's a famous person, maybe it's, you know, somebody in a band, maybe it's an actor, maybe it's a politician, that, that let's just say if you met them, you would fanboy or fangirl over them. Can, can you think of somebody you would do that if you like met somebody? How many have ever met a celebrity and you just got a little fanboy, fangirl, like, ah. they're, they're around here a lot, by the way. I've had a, I've had a lot of run-ins uh, you know, in the wild with you know, famous people. I'm like, that's so weird, they're right there. And, and so, you know, imagine this person that you just like, you follow, and you're just like, wow. And, and imagine their personal assistant finds out that you're a big fan. And this politician, this singer, this musician, this actor, they, they find out that, that you are a big fan and they're coming through Thousand Oaks. And they're only coming through Thousand Oaks tomorrow morning. The, the personal assistant calls you and says, hey, so-and-so found out you're a big fan and guess what? They wanna have coffee with you. One-on-one, <laughs> -on -one. they just wanna sit down and have coffee with you. But here's the catch. They can only meet at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's the only day. Now, I, I'm telling you right now, if you had something scheduled at 5 a.m., if you had to go to work, you're calling in sick, all right? Maybe it's a lie God doesn't care about. I don't know. But, but maybe, maybe you're going to, you know, uh, blow off some sleep. You're know, like, hey, you know, Monday's the day I sleep in. You're waking up early. I don't care if you even got like two hours sleep. You're waking. You are making that 5 a.m. appointment. You're not going to let that opportunity pass by. Well, here's what we have. We have God who's bigger than any celebrity on this earth. 
who's saying, not only do I give you an all access pass, I want to meet with you every morning, every day. I want, I want to meet with you. And I want to speak to you as one speaks to a friend. Because here's what you need to know now. Check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, do you not know that you are God's temple? You can put in that and substitute the word tabernacle. You are God's tabernacle. And that God's spirit dwells in you? That means this, the same portal that was erected in the book of Exodus has now been erected in your heart. It's there. You have access to it. Now, go, going back to this idea, this, this understanding, um, I got I to gotta check my text messages here because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. All right, all right, okay. All right, so... All right. Do you guys recognize this band? How many 80s kids do we have in the house? All right. So I just got to tell you a little bit about my childhood, all right? When I was a teenager, I listened to all the rock bands, all right? So uh, people now call them glam rock, but this was heavy metal to us, right? You know, we, we, all these. But I found out these dudes were rockers, but they loved Jesus. And I was like, oh, I'm in, I'm in. And I, and I wasn't just in a little ways, I was all in. Like I bought everything that they did. This is an original vinyl record with their picture on the vinyl. It's still a mint condition. It's a limited edition. I'm number uh, 10,800 right here, baby. All right. I listen to all their music. To the point I would run, like I would ruin the cassette tape. I listened to it so much, all right? Um, in the 80s, uh, MTV actually used to play music videos, all right? Uh, and they would have like the, the top 10 music videos every afternoon. And Striper was like almost number one all the time in 1987 with all these songs. But their most famous song, I think, is To Hell with the Devil. To uh, how? Uh, I'm not going to sing it, right? All right. But... But I, I mean, I, I listened to their music. I, I bought all the rock magazines. I had, I had a whole wall in my bedroom that was yellow and black. And it just had all, all the, the stuff that, that Striper had. Big fan, big fan. I can't stress enough. So fast forward, okay? In our Vegas church, uh, there was a gal that I got to know really well. Her name was Annie. She had a ministry there. And she told me that she had been seeing this guy uh, that was in a Christian rock band. And I go, oh, yeah? I go, uh, what's the rock band? She goes, Striper. Have you heard of them? I go, what? I go, which one? She goes, Oz Fox. I go, what? That's the lead guitarist. I know Oz Fox. And well, I, I know of him, but I don't know him. And she goes, oh, I'll introduce you. And I'm like, what? Well, she, she ends up getting married and I get invited to the wedding and all the guys from Striper are there, right? And so I'm like, what? And Tara's just laughing the whole time going, man, you are fanboying hard. I'm like, wow, this is my childhood right here. This is, this is amazing. And, and so I'm like meeting all the guys and taking, you know, pictures with them. And, and of course, Oz is getting married to Annie. So guess what? Oz moves to Vegas. Guess what? He starts attending our church. I'm like preaching, and Oz is like right there. And he's like, like I'm like, hey, Oz Fox is at my, my church right now. This is so weird. So I get to talking to him afterwards. He's like, yeah, it was a really good sermon. I go, hey, would you ever want to go get some lunch sometime? He goes, I would love that. So I remember our first lunch. I'm sitting there having lunch with Oz Fox going, man, I can't I'm having lunch with Oz Fox. And he's, and he's the most humble guy. Most humble guy. And he's like, oh, man, you know, I'm just a regular guy. I'm like, no, you are Oz Fox. <laughs> well, I, I found he loves pancakes. I'm like, we got to go to breakfast sometimes. So, so I just developed this relationship with him over time, and he became really active in our church. And I, I have a couple pictures to prove it, all right? So, <laughs> so we were twinning that day at church. He's like, hey, dude, we got to take a picture together. And, and then we were at a wedding. Uh, together and so we, we just took some pictures and and, and then it was crazy because he was like hey uh, the guys are all in Vegas and th we need to film a music video because they're still producing music 40 years later these guys are still rocking 
And so they make a music video and they want to use our church and our stage to make a striper music video. They, and he said, do you think the church should be okay? I go, I don't care what the church says. I say yes. <laughs> so they film a music video at our church. And I was just loving this, okay? So the Sunday after they filmed the video, they're all in town still, and they all decide that they wanted to pay tribute to this church that allowed them to shoot their music video. So they all came to church. And it happened to be my final Sunday as a lead pastor of the Vegas church. And so I didn't waste the moment. I took a selfie on the stage with the whole band right there at our Vegas church. And I was like, ah. Oh. What a moment, what a moment, what a, what a way to just like, a, you know, a grand finale, you know, have the whole band here. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was an amazing thing. But, you know, I could be here all day and just like uh, tell you about Oz Fox. And I could just say, you know, Oz such a good dude. And, and uh, man, you know, it, it, let me tell you about his family. Let me tell you how he got into rock music. Let me tell you how he got into guitar. Or, you know what, I could just call him right now, okay? I could just call him and... We could just like, you know, that's why I was like, I, I had to check because, you know, he's playing in Spokane. Hey, that's Jim. What's up, Oz? How's it going? <laughs> hey, hey, the 11.30 a.m. gathering wanted to say hi. Say hi, Oz. Hi. Yo, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> so, bro, what are you doing right now? Well, um, the bus call was at noon. We're all, uh, uh, everybody's on the bus. Um, we're pulling into the venue now, and they're going to back the trailer up and offload all the gear, and, and we'll do sound check in about, I don't know, maybe about an hour and a half or so, and we'll be ready for a show here at the Knitting Factory in Spokane, Washington. So here you are 40 years later still rocking it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess God has, uh, he, he, he still thinks I'm 30 years old or something. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, so, Oz, can you validate uh, that we're friends? Oh, validate that we are friends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, of course. My gosh. Uh, you know, we go back uh, since, uh, well, you came to our wedding. My, mine and Annie's wedding. Weren't you and Tara there? Yeah, we were there. Yeah. And um, I, was taking, the, I was taking pictures with all, all of you guys. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you hung out with all the striper guys. We came to the church in Vegas and, and uh, guess where you met Perry for the first time. And by the way, Perry right now is uh, on a motorcycle somewhere in, up at Spokane Mountain. Uh, is he okay? No, he just told us, I'll meet you at the gig. And he sent us a picture. <laughs> I guess he can do that. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, my gosh, we've had so much uh, great time, so many great times. Um, and, you know, my wife Annie met you. Uh, when she started going to uh, Valley Bible Fellowship and uh, when Pastor Ron started the church there and then uh, and then you took over and, and we started coming to your church and, you know, it was, it's been a great uh, relationship between us for quite some time now, you know, and um, it's always awesome to see you come to the shows when you can and we get a chance to talk every now and then, hang out, have, have something to eat or whatever. Hey, you were telling me the other day uh, how young people are discovering Striper and they're they're coming dressed in yellow and black. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know, well, I guess there's a Striper resurgence happening. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's funny because we meet their parents and they're like, "Ah, we're carrying on the the banner of Striper," you know, with our kids, and and that's pretty pretty neat, you know. I mean, if anything, God is getting the glory everywhere we go, and these kids are catching on to the idea, you know, um, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And it's such a blessing to see it happen. You know, it's awesome. Well, bro, I love you and uh, thank you for your time and, and go rock, uh, the faces off of Washington. All right. I will do that. Thank you so much. Love you guys at atmosphere and 
Hopefully, uh, Annie and I will get to come and visit you guys soon. All right. Love you, bro. That was Oz Fox. He's on my phone. Why am I bringing that up? Well, he's awesome. That's number one. But number two is as awesome as that is, you have the same access to God that I have with Oz. You, you can call him. You could be with him. You could hang out with him. And he wants you to do it. He wants to talk to you as a friend talks to a friend. And as I think about the, the benefits of just the presence of God and, and, and how accessible it is to us now, and, and we just, I, I think we just take it for granted when in reality, some of you, you're, you're in some big trouble. There's some stuff in your life. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. And I don't want to oversimplify some very complex issues that you may be going through. But I I do want to highlight the reality that the presence of God is so powerful that it can change the worst situation that you are dealing with right now in your life. And let me just tell you the three things that I can really see the, the presence of God in your life and you being intentional to be with God, to, to let God dwell with you. Like, I, I, I've just got to just highlight these things because I, I believe so many of us are neglecting the one thing that can help us the most, which is God's presence. Number one, write this down. The power of God's presence will relieve the pressure. It relieves the pressure. And I will tell you, all of us are dealing with pressure to one degree or another. we got some pressure coming at us. Now, I felt as I was praying for you guys for this message, I felt like I had a word for somebody. And I felt like somebody here today, your pressure is next level. It's been next level all week. It was so bad that you almost didn't make it to church today. Maybe the pressure's coming at you with a, a family dynamic. Maybe the pressure is more career, work-related. Maybe it's a financial pressure. But the pressure is so next level for you right now, you you almost feel like you're going to pop. It's it's that pressured. And the bad thing about pressure, when it builds up, it also deflates your peace. Have you noticed that? The more pressure you feel, the less peace you experience. So pressure and peace kind of like work together like that. The less pressure, the more peace. But I want to take you to the presence of God because the presence of God is what deflates the pressure for your life. When when you're in the presence of God, the pressure deflates. And so the more presence of God, the more peace of God you start experiencing in your life because the, the pressure starts deflating. And it doesn't mean the problems go away, but the pressure of the problem starts getting minimized because why? The presence of God is so much bigger than the pressure. How do you get into the presence of God so tangibly and so practically? It's called worship. Worship is the most tangible way that you are going to encounter the presence of God. Let me give you what the Life Application Bible had a little footnote Believe it or not, on this text from Ezekiel chapter 48, it was, it was sometimes in the Life Application Study Bible, man, sometimes the little commentary will hit me stronger than the actual scripture. This is one of those things. Just listen to this. The pressures of everyday life, it writes, may cause us to focus on the here and now and thus forget God. That is why we need to worship. It takes our eyes off our current worries, gives us a glimpse of God's holiness, and allows us to look towards his future kingdom. Check this out. God's presence makes everything glorious, and worship brings us into his presence. Instead of getting all worried and caught up in the pressure, some of you, the most godly thing you could do this week is not listen to another podcast, not read another book, not book another session with your therapist. And I believe in podcasts, I believe in books, and I believe in therapy. But the greatest thing some of you can do to relieve the pressure 
is to park yourself in a quiet room, throw some AirPods on, and blast some worship music between those ears. Because your mind, when it starts being just inundated with the glory and the magnet, the, the uh, God being magnified, what happens is when God is magnified, your problems are minimized. So some of you, the pressure will be deflated in the presence of God. And the presence of God is brought in the worship of God. So how are you doing with worship? I, I love music. I love all kinds of music. I love rock music. Hey, I'm in this country music thing right now, all right? Um, I'm from Bakersfield, so <laughs> it follows me. But, you know, as much as I love rock music and country music, nothing is as life-giving as worship music. We have, a, we have an atmosphere worship music playlist on, on Spotify. Listen to it. Get into some worship. And just don't do it. Just close your eyes. Let the worship music just play. And, and just start experiencing the presence of God in the midst of your car, in the midst of your house. Just take some time. And let the presence of God deflate the pressure in your life. Here's the number two. Write this down. And that is the presence of God fills the joy bucket. How many of you can use a little bit more joy in your life? Now, if you're new to atmosphere, you might have never heard me say this. But one of our core values is we choose joy. I'm a firm believer that joy is not an emotion that you feel. It's an attitude you choose. So you can be joyful even though your circumstances are anything but joyful. And case in point is the Apostle Paul. He wrote a whole book of the Bible called the book of Philippians. And he's just like, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. And if you don't know the context, you're like, he's such a happy guy. But he writes this whole letter while he's incarcerated, while he's in prison. So when you know the context of what he's writing, you're like, wow, how can he be joyful even though his circumstances are are so unjoyful. And the reason is, is because he had tapped into the presence of God to where his circumstances didn't dictate his attitude. And this is what happens for all of us. Your attitude is shaped by the presence of God in your life. The more presence of God in your life, it makes room for more joy for your life. It's easier to choose joy when you're in the presence of God. Listen to how David writes it in Psalm 16. He says, your presence fills me with what, church? Joy. joy. And it brings me pleasure forever. You could be having a bummer of a day. You could be full of discouragement and you get into the presence of God, the circumstances don't change, nothing really changes on the issues, but all of a sudden your countenance changed. Why? Because God has this amazing supernatural ability to get a hold of your attitude and shift it. Anybody have a bad attitude this week? Isn't it crazy to think that just being in the presence of God can shift your attitude? And discouragement can be replaced by encouragement simply because you are making a choice to be in the presence of God. Jesus chimes in on this idea of joy because, I mean, even back in biblical times, they needed more joy. So Jesus says, hey, you know what the source of joy is? Is being connected with me. That's what he goes on record to say. He, he uses this word abide. It could be translated to continue to remain with. But the idea is connection. And in John chapter 15, we just read this this week in our daily Bible reading plan. He said in verse 9, he says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Then here it is, remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. And just as I obey my Father's commandments, remember we talked about that last week, and remain in his love, and I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. How is our joy going to overflow? By being connected with him. By being connected with Jesus. By intentionally saying, I want to be in your presence, Jesus. There was a book that really shaped this idea of the presence of God for my life. And it was written 
by an, an 18th century monk called Brother Lawrence. How many have heard of this book? It's called Practicing the Presence of God. Because we can get so preoccupied with everything that we've got going on. And the enemy of your soul knows that what is going to help you win in your faith is to be connected with God. So you know what the enemy of your soul is going to do? He's going to do everything to try to stop you from connecting with God. See, he doesn't have to make you sin. He just has to interrupt your ability to tap into the presence of God daily for your life. Get you distracted with work, get you busy with the family. Ah, I'm not connecting with God. Well, as soon as that starts fading, your attitude shifts for the worse, the pressure gets going against your life and pretty soon you're off course. So if I were your adversary and I knew your power source was being in the presence of God, I'm coming after your time in the presence of God. So that's why some of you, your, your only way to meet with God is you have to wake up early before the chaos starts. I learned that as a young dad. I was like, I can't do my devotions when all the kids are awake. So there was a season of my life, thank God they're all adults now and I don't have to do this because I hated it. I would have to wake up at four in the morning to have quietness in my home just to get a hold of the presence of God, to be intentional, to practice the presence of God in my life. For you young parents, I know it's early. 4 a.m., you're like, man, I don't even think God's awake at 4 a.m. He is. Sometimes he'll wake you up. He'll say, hey, it's time to meet with me. Some of you, you just thought it was insomnia. It was actually God trying to say, spend time with me. Hey, what if we did that? I don't know who this was. What if we did that? Next time we get frustrated, oh, I can't sleep. What if we just choose to believe it is the Lord's supernatural ability and way that he's saying, hey, come meet with me. Get up. Go, go sit on that chair, open the book, put on some worship music, and just sit with me. Wow. Wow, I'm changing somebody's insomnia right now. <laughs> wow, giving you a whole new perspective on this thing. So, so you, you can see what I'm talking about. It's attitude. It's attitude. God's presence will shift your attitude, and you will be filled with joy. Now, here's the third that I think is probably the most important, significant part of what the presence of God brings for us, and that is it brings us fire. Brings the fire. Look at your neighbor and say, it brings the fire. And don't, don't just say it like fire. Say, fire. <laughs> brings the fire. I love the 1130 gathering. The fire. Have you ever connected the dots in the church where in the Bible it talks so often about the presence of God being connected with fire? Think about Moses' first encounter with God. It's in a burning bush. There's a fire. Moses is like, what is that? And God's like, I, 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 I'm speaking from the bush. I'm, this bush is on fire. And then he uses fire to lead the, the children of Israel in the Exodus. He's like, follow the fire. That God was in the fire. What's interesting, Bible students listen to this, that John comes and he starts baptizing people before Jesus is activated in his ministry. And it records in, in uh, Luke 3 and I believe in Matthew 3, it says that when John was baptizing, he says, I'm baptizing you with water for repentance, but there's one coming after me that is going to baptize you with fire. He's speaking of Jesus. He said, Jesus is going to bring you the fire of God's presence. This is why preaching this message on this day that is known as Pentecost Sunday is so powerful to me. Because one of the biggest experiences of the new church happens in Acts chapter 2. That is what we now call Pentecost Sunday. 50 days after Passover. So Jesus has been crucified, he's been resurrected, and now 50 days have passed by, and he told him before he ascended back into heaven, he says, go wait for me, my helper's coming. So they went and put themselves in this upper room, they didn't know when the shoe was going to drop, they didn't know when they were going to be arrested, they didn't know when they were going to be killed, they just heard Jesus say, hang out together and, and wait for me to give you the next step. 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Think about that. The fire that they were so accustomed to being out there representing God is now descending on them and living in them. Unprecedented. What? And immediately these men that were hanging out in the room full of fear became full of faith. And they went out of the room and they went down to the streets and they started evangelizing Jesus to everybody that would listen to them. And thousands of people became followers of Jesus because of that moment. What, what would motivate men who were hiding out to be emboldened and courageous in an instant and run down there? I will tell you what, it was the fire of God. The fire of God is not intimidated by anything in this world. And when you are filled with that fire of God, my friend, nothing in this world will intimidate you anymore. But you gotta be filled with the fire. The fire was given to the disciples through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the fire of God. But it's up to us on, on how we want that fire to be activated in our life. And, and there's two primary things that happen when you are activated with the fire of God in you. See, first, number one, write this down, is the fire is a consuming fire. It's consuming. Meaning when it is activated in you and the presence of God is dwelling in you, then it has this natural disposition to burn off all the stuff in your life that is impure. That's why as a pastor, I don't need to get up here and say, oh church, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. I can give you a laundry. We could be here till next Tuesday telling you all the things you shouldn't do with your life. Or I could just say, hey, get into the presence of God because he has this ability in his power, in his presence to surface all the impurities of your life and burn them all off of your life. He does it every week. Isaiah, he has this vision and he's, he's at the throne of God. The train of God's robe is filling the entire room and he's realizing that I'm in the presence of Almighty God. And the first thing he realizes is he is a man of unclean lips. I don't know if Isaiah had a cussing problem or if just like he just was in an issue where, where he's like, man, I just, I've spoken things and, and being in the presence of God just surfaced all of this junk that he knew he had in his life that wasn't right with God. And God reveals so that God can heal. He wanted to heal Isaiah of all these impurities and he burned them off of him. He sent an angel to come and he put a coal in his lip, did some crazy stuff. And all because Isaiah was in the presence of God. There's stuff you're battling and I don't wanna minimize this stuff. I don't wanna just like simplify and say, oh, it's no big deal. No, I know it's a big deal. There's drug addicts in this room. There are people that are completely with strongholds of porn in your life in this room. There are people, you're battling anger and rage and your temper, and, and there's some serious issues. Prescription drug abuse is in this room right now. And I know it can feel so daunting. It can feel so, you know, you can feel so caught up and, and shackled to this thing. But I want to tell you, and I'm going to give you the good news. The presence of God is bigger than the power of the shackles of your sin and your shame. And when you climb into the presence of God, he has this amazing, powerful ability to break the chains that are holding you back from the promise of God for your future. Come on, somebody. This is what he does. Podcasts are good. Books are good. Therapy's good. But the presence of God is great. It's the best. Don't neglect all those other things. 
if first step is you're in the presence of God, then those other things can be an extra helper for you. But the biggest help that you can get is just let the consuming fire rage over your life. Who's that for this morning? Let the consuming fire rage over your life. I believe addiction is going to be burned up in the process. And if you don't believe that, if you don't have the faith to believe that, borrow mine. Because I've seen it happen again and again and again and again. And I believe it's going to happen for you. I really do. The second thing, and this is really important, is that this fire is contagious. It's consuming, but it's also contagious. Have you ever heard the expression, maybe you've used it before, but like, man, that guy, that girl, they're on fire for God. They're, they're on fire for God. Oh, that sermon, man, that sermon was fire. There's even emojis now. People are like, oh, that's fire. What do they mean by that? They mean it's so inspiring that it actually helped them out in some way or another. Fire is contagious. It doesn't just stay where it's at. It, it tends to spread. And there's something about when, when you're in the presence of God, uh, you don't have to go around. You don't have to wear a Christian t-shirt for people to recognize it. When, when you are in the fire of God's presence, like, like people will come. I still remember vividly. I think I was like six years old, seven years old. In our neighborhood at the end of our street, there was a dilapidated house. The, the fire department decided that they were going to use this house as a training house for a fire. So they set the place on fire. This really happened. Eight blocks of neighborhood kids came together to watch this house burn. I know we're sick kids, but we're just like, whoa. It was amazing. Because when a house is on fire like that, people just want to come and watch it. And there was a, a minister years ago that had a huge church. And people were like, what's the secret sauce? Like, what? how, how do you explain why thousands of people are coming to your ministry? And he says, I, I don't know. I don't have a formula. I don't have a secret sauce. But I've come to the conclusion. My whole goal and my whole job is to get into the presence of God and let God's fire consume my life. And when I get on fire, people just like to come and watch me burn. That's why people are coming to my church. And I want to challenge you. I believe you will be a voice of influence for the kingdom of God, not because you know more scriptures, not because you have a certificate on the wall that says you've got your Bible degree. You, you're not going to have more influence with people because you're, you're going to be able to quote scriptures at them. You're going to have more influence with people when they know that you've been with Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples were, were in this room and, and, and they were just making all of these religious professional people messed up. They were like, man, James and Peter, John, these guys, they're changing the world. And, and it says they, they were ordinary men doing extraordinary things. But it says, but we knew they were men that had been with Jesus. If you, if you want to see extraordinary things come from your life, then you have to be able to say the same thing. I've been with Jesus, and extraordinary things will start happening from your life. Ordinary people. The word in the, the Greek language is idiotis. Where do you think our English word is for that? <laughs> Idiots. Idiots being used by God. Why? Because they've been with Jesus. That's all it takes. Pretty simple. But you want to be contagious, you got to be with him. There was a, a guy years ago that started kind of floundering in his faith. He stopped going to church. He was MIA. He was missing in action, as I like to say. And one of the guys on staff is like, hey, man, have you seen Joe lately? And the staff is like, man, we haven't seen him. So he decides that he's going to go visit Joe. It was a cold day. And he goes over to Joe's house. And Joe's got the fireplace roaring. The pastor comes in. So we miss you, bro. And Joe takes them over there, and they sit down, and they just are in front of the fireplace, and the pastor just looks at the fire, looks at Joe, doesn't say anything, just gets the tongs out from the fireplace kit, and he pulls out a little ember from the fire, and he just puts it on the hearth there right next to the fireplace. And they just sit there together quietly, just looking at the fire, and they watch this ember. It was glowing. It was burning, and it just grew cold and dark. 
and they just looked at the ember. And the pastor looked at Joe, didn't say a word, took the tongs, took the ember, and put it back in the fire. And quickly, just like that, that ember came alive again. It started glowing again. It started, started raging in the fire again. And Joe took the pastor and said, man, thank you for coming by. And the pastor left. Didn't even really say anything to him after that. And Joe said, also, thank you for the fiery sermon. <laughs> because he didn't need to say anything. What he was telling Joe is, is if, you, if you choose to be the ember that is out of the fire, you're, you're not going to last long. Your glow and your ability to influence and change the world is completely dependent on your being in the fire yourself. And as long as you're in the fire, you're going to be burning. You're going to be glowing. You're going to be making a difference in other people's lives. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a pastor's gathering, and um, it was pretty cool. I, I took the whole team there, and, and we were just getting refreshed. Your pastor needed to be refreshed. And the worship started happening. And it's not like, you know, I was, like, burned out or whatever, but just the worship started and just... Have you ever just been in like a church service like this where you just worship and you just feel this next level presence of God come over you? Has that ever happened to anybody here? So I'm in this moment and, and I just, I just, I don't even know what happened. I just, I hit, I hit the stage or not the stage, but I hit, I just hit the stage, but I, my knees hit the floor and I'm just worship. I'm crying. The presence of God is just being, just poured out of my life. And then I saw a vision. And the, it was so clear to me. And it was a weird vision. It was like this mechanical Jesus face from like a carnival. I wasn't tripping on acid or anything. Don't, don't worry. But I had this mind, like I was like, what is it? What am I saying? And the mouth mechanically like opens like real slow. And this water started pouring out, gushing out of the mouth like a faucet. And just started pouring out. It's like, what am I seeing? And it was like I, in the, the moment I'm worshiping. My God, what are you showing me? And then it all came together this week. He showed me. He said, Jim, my people, including you, are, are so easily entertained that you're content being downstream in my water, just playing in the water that is coming from me when I'm the source of water. And we have a downstream issue happening in the church of America. We're content with the goodies of God. And we're missing on the best part of God. And that's his presence in our life. Stop selling yourself short and being downstream and receiving the water that is flowing from him when you have the source of water that is wanting to be with you. You guys, receive that today. I believe the Spirit of God is wanting to do something so great and so powerful in your life. And it's so simple that we miss it. He wants to dwell with you. He wants to be with you. He wants to talk to you like a friend talks to a friend. And every moment, every day, He has an appointment to say, be with me. The pressure is completely depressurized. The discouragement is replaced with joy. And the fire begins to burn. Father, in this moment, God, I know there's some people here that your presence right now is getting a hold of them. It's overtaking them. God, I feel like some pressure is just being lifted off some people. It's just, it's like air leaving a, a like a, like a balloon, it's just, whew, the pressure is just completely being depressurized. Thank you for your presence in this room right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Fire fall down. Let your fire come. Burn away the stuff. Burn in us, oh God. Lord, let your joy 
overtake our discouragement in Jesus' name. Thank you for your presence, oh God. The creator of all things wants to meet with us. We are so incredibly grateful. While everyone is praying and the spirit of God is revealing to you, some of you aren't right with God. You're far from God. Jesus is calling you, my friend. He wants to change your life. Step one for you is he wants to rescue you out of your captivity. So how he does that is he comes and lives on the inside of you. So some of you, step one today is you need to receive Jesus and the power that he has to set you free today. So if you've never prayed that Jesus would come and lead your life, then I wanna pray this prayer with you. You just pray this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for dying for my sins and resurrecting from the grave so that you can let your spirit come and live in me. Bring your fire to my life, oh God. Set me free. Let me live out the promised destiny you have for my future that can only happen in Jesus. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, tell somebody, tell us, and you can tell us by texting the word follow, 805-334-8700. We wanna give you a Bible, some other great resources. But maybe this is your day, that you're returning to the presence of God, and it's been a long time. The great thing about the presence of God, it hasn't went anywhere. You're just returning to it. And my prayer today is that you would meet God in a way that maybe you haven't met with him in a long, long time. So maybe you're not a singer at heart, but I want you to sing these lyrics and I want you to enter into this moment. And maybe some of you need to come to the altar. You just need to, to make some, some posturing changes and say, God, I, I wanna be with you because I realized today that you want to be with me. So if you're able to, would you stand or, or maybe even come up to the altar if you would, but let's take a few minutes and enter into the presence of God through worship. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be a part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.